Raquel with the Internet Grief Institute, and this is Moments of Hope, a show featuring ordinary people who have turned pain into purpose to do good things in the world. And tonight's guest is Clayton Curtis. Hello, Clayton. Hello, Linda. It's nice to be here. Oh, I'm so glad that you joined us tonight. You have a remarkable story. You know, as we talk about loss and death and grief, uh, many people don't know what it's like at all. And then when they have one death, they're not sure that they're going to survive. I know that that's how I felt. I wasn't sure I was going to survive. And you have not only had one death, you have had three, all of them due to cancer. And I want to go back to the beginning of your story. And before we get to your purpose, which is uh, writing for a cure, which is super cool, but I want to know your backstory. So what was your first loss? My first loss was my older brother, Dick. Uh, he was okay. about six or seven years older than I am. And growing up, of course, you have a, a brother like that and he becomes your idol. He becomes your, your, your model. You want to be just like him. And I obviously never could be because he was on a pedestal, but he was my first loss. Yeah. And he died from lung cancer. He did. He did. This was in okay. 2004. Um, he came to visit us his college reunion that in New Haven was that weekend and uh, in early June and he and his wife came up from Virginia and they stayed in our house here and they would go in for the reunion and then come back here. And I got to spend some really more than quality time with him uh, in those wow. few days. And it was really, it was really quite sweet, but he didn't know it, but he was, there was a cancer growing in him that had moved from his lungs into his stomach and into different parts of his body. And he died just two months later down in Virginia. Is that right? Yeah. So, so he had no idea that he was even ill. No, he didn't. He had no idea. He thought until the middle of July, he thought it was acid reflux. Is uh, that right? Yeah. But it was, it went, he went very quickly and he was a guy in good shape. I mean, he was an all American swimmer and um, sailor and all. He was a, he was a terrific guy. So he was an athlete. He sure was. And, yeah. yeah. And you know, you look back on that and the fact that he was able to come stay with you, he and his wife mm -hmm. for that time, it's such a blessing. It was. I mean, it what was. an incredible, you know, opportunity to have some really great conversations. And before he died, and you know, how shocking to find out that he had cancer and then to die three months later. Now, I'm really sorry. How, how did that loss affect you? Not, not as deeply as what I felt with Carolyn and then with Mary. And it's almost like been a kind of a progression that his, his death was not expected, but it didn't really touch me as deeply as anything else the other two have. So it was my first real connection with loss, but it wasn't, it wasn't, so to speak, the real thing. I don't know how, how old to put was it either way. Yeah. How old was he when he passed? He was 72. Okay. Okay. And so then the next loss, actually, before you had your next loss, which was your daughter, Carolyn, mm -hmm. your wife, Mary, who Mary, taught yeah. alongside you. You were both high school teachers. We were. And... You, you were English teacher. She taught alongside you for what, 35 years? Mary taught in, at Trumbull. I, we both taught at a public high school about 15 miles from where I live now in Connecticut. And okay. she was a, she, we were both English teachers. I taught for 37 years. She taught for 35 years. I retired in 1998. Uh, I'm a little bit older than Mary was, uh, but she came to teach in 1971 and we were married in 1975, 74, 74. And we taught together, we carpooled together. We taught across the hall from each other. We would burst into each other's classes. We would, she would send over messages to me. One funny story, she said she would take some of her students aside who she knew were in my class 
And I was very big into music and sound systems and all of that. And she said, she said to the student, she said, if ever he uses the word upgrade, if he ever uses the word upgrade in class, you're to come and tell me instantly. And they would. I would say, listen, I'm thinking about buying a new turntable or a new this or a new that. And they would run across the hall and they would tell her. She would come over and she would drag me back to pronounce a word or to tell them the truth about Robert Frost, The Road Not Taken. But we were both English teachers. We both loved the same literature. We loved the same movies. We spent all of our time together. It's People found this unusual, but we found it to be the way we wanted it to be. We lived together. We taught together. We were together all the time, and it created a singularity. Uh, the first time that one of our friends met us, she thought that Mary's name was Marion Clayton. Is what she thought because we were introduced to everyone as Mary and Clayton, and we had the same Marion, Marion, Marion Clayton, Marion we had, Clayton. We had students at our wedding. Uh, one of our students was the photographer. Um, we had students over to our house. She loved to invite Jewish students over to the house to wrap Christmas presents because she said, otherwise, you don't ever have that opportunity and to decorate oh. a tree. So she, they would oh. bring them over. She, she was just, she was the most one. She was, she, she was the most wonderful, caring, beautiful, sensitive. Um, person, more than a teacher, at her service that we had for her after she died, uh, I left time open in the service for people to talk. And of the nine people who spoke, five of them were former students. And one of them actually flew in from California to New Haven, spoke at her service, and flew back to California. That's, wow. that's, not, that's not an exaggeration. That um, speaks volumes. The, the chapel was, the chapel at Yale was filled, filled. We put out chairs and all, but the irony, Linda, was we were, we were, we had her service in the same chapel where we were married. And oh, it was, I got to choose the music. I got to choose the readings. I got to choose everything about it, and I, I even had one of our former teachers in our in our school, who became a Catholic priest, Father Ed. After he left teaching, he became a Catholic priest, and he conducted her service. But Mary was, Mary was a. She was such a part of my life. She was such. She wasn't a part of my life. She wasn't. Linda, she was such a. She was such a part of me, that I never. I don't think I ever once, ever imagined that she wouldn't be with me, that she wouldn't be there. And I can remember toward the end when I still didn't accept, I, I, I could not accept her not being there until I, I called one of her doctors and I said, Dr. Chung, I don't know what's going on here. I mean. Nobody wants to answer my calls at the hospital. Nobody's getting back to me. The social worker doesn't get back to me. Or it's, I seem to be running up against the wall. Why, why is this? She says, Clayton, don't you know, don't you know that she's dying? And I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't accept it. I, I actually could not accept it. I couldn't, even when she said that, I couldn't go. I couldn't go beyond it. I couldn't. I couldn't find a time. I couldn't see a time, off in the future somewhere where, where she wouldn't be here. And the only so take, take us back, Clayton, to so our viewers understand. She she got cancer. It's six when did days, she first? Six, when five, did she first? Five, get five days after she retired from teaching in July of two thousand six. She was diagnosed with stage three metastatic cancer. Breast um, cancer. Breast cancer. And it had lymph, lymph node involvement. She was subjected 
willingly to every miracle of science that there was. We had wonderful doctors. I, I cannot, I can never ever repay the care that was given to us in the hospitals. Her oncologist, her oncology nurses, uh, she underwent, she, she immediately started treatment. She had uh, chemotherapy, uh, she had radiation. And finally, as the last stage, she had surgery for the, the small, the little nodule that was left behind by the radiation and the chemo. And, and so then, she was cancer free then for a period cured. of time. She was cured. And, she and you, was, moved to, you moved to Jordan. Well, because she wanted to heal a broken world. Is that right? Yeah, that's true. She, uh, a friend of mine had been named the headmaster of a new school in Jordan, a co-educational boarding school in um, outside of Amman, Jordan, set up by King Abdullah II. And we would be teaching students from all over the Middle East, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran, India, China, Egypt. We had students from all over the Middle East because King Abdullah wanted to create a coterie, so to speak, of students who would all and have so a shared experience so that later in life, they could come together as some way making an impact on the Middle East. And we so went over. You thought that you had cancer in your rear view mirror and yes. you set out on this new adventure. Yes, we did. We did. We, we packed up all our belongings. We, we signed a two year contract. We put all our belongings into, into cardboard boxes and bags, bought, bought two cat carriers so we could take our two cats with us. Can't go anywhere without the cats. We, we got to Jordan. We lived in the dormitory in this brand new school. The school was only in its second year of existence. And we lived in a dormitory. We had a nice apartment. We didn't have any students in the dormitory and the cats had free run of the whole, the whole big building. They loved it. Although the funny thing was they don't have cats in Jordan. They don't have pets. And oh kids, my gosh. Well, kids came from all over. <laughs> when we were in JFK <laughs> taking the cats through, we oh had- Oh my gosh at the loading area and there were these little Jordanian boys were getting on Jordanian air. They're pushing French fries into the cage for the cats. They thought this was the most wonderful thing. They were saying, no, no, they don't eat French fries. But uh, <laughs> but we, we went to Jordan. We spent a month, the month of August, we spent um, just getting used to the, to the country. As one of the other teachers said, it's a little bit like Mars. Uh, so we got used to it. And in the first of September, the kids came in, we started teaching and Mary was in heaven. When, her, when she was teaching at Trumbull High School, she taught a course called Peace, Protest and Tolerance. One of the most popular courses in the school and she was easily one of the best, most popular teachers. But she saw this as a way of bringing people together in a, in a torn up world. Wow. She, she began getting sick in the second week of school, in the middle of September. And, and how was she getting sick? Excuse me? How, how was she, what was happening? How was she getting sick? She was throwing up in the mornings. She was, she was and the doctor on campus could not find any reason for it. And the, it, sent, it went away. But about two weeks later, okay. it came back and there was nothing he could, he couldn't figure it out. So they hospitalized her in Amman, in a very good hospital. And they did an endoscopy to see what was causing her stomach upset. And the doctor told me when he called me in to talk to me, he said, I'm sorry, we can't find anything wrong with her. We can't find any, any issues here. Uh, is there anything I should know about her history? Now, the doctor on the campus knew about her cancer, but the doctor in the hospital did not. And I told him, I said, you know, she's, she's only recently recovered from breast cancer. And he looked at me and he said, well, I think this changes things and we're going to have to do some tests. So I went back to the school. They drove me back to the school. The school did they had a, they had a car that was had a driver which would take us around. And he took me back to the school. And the next day, it was around 10 o'clock in the morning and the doctor called. And he said, I think I, I, I think you better come in. I've got to talk to you. So I went into the hospital and uh, he took me down into the basement and he showed me all the MRI scans along the wall. There were dozens and dozens and dozens of screens. 
and he went through all of them and then he said do you see that little that little gray mass there we don't know what that is but we think we think it's a tumor and we don't know what to do with it so i looked at him and i said doctor i've got to tell you that i have the greatest respect for you and for your team over here and i know how good you are but you've got to tell me honestly should we go back to the united states for treatment and he conferred with his with his colleagues there and he said does she have an oncologist in the states i said yes and you should take her home so he packed up mary was mary was in pretty good bad shape now because what had happened is the tumor had been sending cancer cells into her spinal fluid and that was causing her not to be able to walk and it was doing all sorts of other things to her system well we got her home it was wasn't very easy it was a pretty arduous trip coming home got her home got her into the hospital and then that same doctor, Dr. Chung, took me aside and said, Clayton, we've got to get chemotherapy into her brain. And the only way we can do that is if we drill through her skull and put a tube into her brain. And we put a we put what's called an omaya on her forehead and we drip chemotherapy through that into the meninges. And they did that. I couldn't I I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I mean, this is science fiction. This is this right. is not possible. And then I, the day of the surgery, I met her surgeon. She was about 12. Uh, <laughs> I looked at her, I said, I, I, I guess I didn't say this, this was all inside me. I said, you're, you're the surgeon? She was a, a beautiful young woman, uh, but she was very, very talented. And she did the surgery. They put the chemotherapy in. The, the chemotherapy killed the cells, which were causing her all the upset, but it didn't touch the tumor so she was having so, for 45 days go ahead well so just for our viewers to understand the meninges is like a neck covering that goes over the brain mm -hmm. and uh, and so i just wanted to clarify um a lot of people aren't familiar with medical terms and such and so and so it it killed the cancer cells but not the tumor yes. and while she was in the hospital mm -hmm. You got a call from your daughter. Um, no, that was that was later. That was okay. that was a little bit later. That was not quite okay. then, although it was fairly soon thereafter. You're right, Linda. That now that I think of it, it was. I got a call from my daughter Carolyn, um, who lives in Virginia, and she had been diagnosed with melanoma. But the melanoma was of, in all places, her stomach. I had never heard of that. No one I've ever talked to has ever heard of it. But I actually know now that there are instances where melanoma it can can appear in the stomach. And she went through. So it was it was in the stomach, not on the stomach. It was it was actually in the stomach. Yes. So she was going through treatment for that, and. Uh, we went to see her. She came up here. She, uh, we had some very good times together. We rented. She rented a house down in uh, Hilton Head. And we spent Mary and I spent a wonderful, you know, week with them down there. We had some good times. After Mary got out of the hospital, uh, up here, she eventually made a pretty good recovery. They tried okay. to treat the the brain tumor with something called CyberKnife, which they did two sessions with that, but it may not have worked. Um, okay. But the years went by. We actually, as I said, we had we had some good years there. We did some good traveling. We visited friends in Florida. We have a Chinese couple that stayed kind of with us when they were studying at Yale, a husband and wife. We met them in Las Vegas for a week. It was we had some we had some very nice times together, memories. and some building some terrific memories. But then in the summer, um, oh, on Memorial Day of two thousand. 14, Carolyn was declared cancer free. She was okay. She was cured. She was done. She and her new husband. I haven't even explained the fact that Carolyn had lost her husband, Steve, uh, a few years before. She and Steve had two kids, my grandchildren. But Steve died of a heart disease when they were living in uh, Virginia Beach in, in Chesapeake. 
Uh, My Carolyn, goodness. what's that? My goodness. Carolyn, um, they had just bought a house. She had a mortgage. Carolyn was a high school teacher. She was a chemistry teacher. Where she got her idea of being a chemistry teacher, I don't know. I couldn't, I can't boil water, so I can't do chemistry, but she was a gifted, gifted chemistry teacher, nationally certified. And she was there with two little kids, Kenny, eight, Holly, three, when she, when she lost Steve. But she met another Steve. She met another Steve, Steve Sharp. And they met through one of these, I don't know if you can call it a matchmaking service online. Mm -hmm. They met right. down in Virginia Beach where Steve's family was from. They fell in love. They got married. They put their two families together, built a house in Fredericksburg. And they had a very nice light. Steve was wonderful to, to my kids, to my grandchildren. They became his children. And he was just, he was wonderful with them. And Carolyn was just, Carolyn was just fine. But as I said, she was diagnosed with the melanoma. And on Memorial Day of, the four, of 2014, she thought she was cancer free. She and Steve went to their favorite place down on Virginia Beach. And that was on a Friday, it was Memorial Day weekend. And she woke up on Saturday morning and she couldn't move her left arm and she couldn't move her left leg. And they brought her back up to Fredericksburg and they discovered there were tumors all through her brain. And it was, there wasn't an awful lot they could do. Um, all sorts of strange things were going on. Holly, my, my beautiful, talented young granddaughter, was just starting her freshman year at Liberty University when Carolyn was hospitalized in September. And actually it was over the summer, but she was fully hospitalized in September. And Holly was going through her first few weeks at Liberty, which is about 100, 150 miles west of where they were. Kenny was just in the Navy. He was being assigned to a ship. So there was a lot of hither and thither and yon going on. Yeah. But Carolyn was, uh, Carolyn was in the hospital there in, in at Mary Washington Hospital in, in Fredericksburg. And uh, we had gone down to see her in the summer in July. Mary was able to make that trip, barely. It was, it was a, a long trip because we had to stop so often for Mary. She was, Mary was in, mm -hmm. she was in dire straits by that time. And uh, when Carolyn died in very early October, uh, I had to go, I, I had to leave Mary. I had, to, I had not been away from her side in seven years. And I had to leave her because I, I could not not go. I had, I had to. So we brought friends in to stay with Mary while I was gone. Now, Linda, I've never, I've never realized that there is such a thing that can happen. But I drove myself down from here in New Haven down to, down to Fredericksburg. And uh, I walked, I walked into the funeral home, and it was a fairly, fairly large room. And I could see on the on the far side of the room was where the coffin. There was an open coffin. It was on the other side of the room. As I as I crossed the room, I could I could see that I could see Carolyn. And I I I, I thought I thought this was all fantasy. I thought this was all fiction. That I I actually I actually collapsed. I actually began to fall to the floor. I was I felt myself falling. When I felt these arms come around from me, from behind, and it was, it was my granddaughter and my grandson, and they, they held me, they, they pulled me into their grasp, and they supported me, and I said, I cannot tell you how you have saved me, how you are supporting me, she said. Holly said, don't you remember when our dad died, he did the same for us. I said, oh my God. But Carolyn was 51 years old. She was way, way too young. And she had so much more. She had, she was one of those teachers, you know, one of those, one of those teachers that 
years and years and years later, you look back and say, God, she just made all the difference. She was, she was a wonderful person. And, and so with her death, and you had to travel to her funeral on your own because your wife, Mary, was so ill from her own cancer. She was not out of bed. She could not get out of bed. How, how did you cope? How did, how did Mary cope? I had my son with me. Um, I, he joined me down there. My son, Clayton, who lives up here, drove down there separately than I did. And we spent that night together. And that was important. Uh, having Clayton with me at that point was important. And to know how Carolyn approached everything, and how she valued her family and how she valued all the people around her, I realized that she was she was gonna she was gonna see me through this. She and Kenny and Holly and Steve were gonna get me through this, and they did. And they they did. And I drove home after the service on that was on a that was on a Thursday, I think. She died the, the I drove down on Thursday and on Friday was the service, a lovely service. It was a beautiful service. And then I drove back Friday afternoon in the rain. And I, I came into my house here and I, there has never been, I have, when we came back together, when Mary and I came back together at that point, I realized that we were really we really were one person. We were we were one entity. We were not we were not separate. We were we were one. And I had never I, I think I said before that I had I had never ever ever thought of a life where Mary was not there. Um, and yet as the month went by, as a couple of months went by and we got into December, um, she was I couldn't recognize it, but I guess I knew somewhere that she was she was failing. And our anniversary, our wedding anniversary, our 40th wedding anniversary was on the 21st of December. That was on a Sunday. And uh, I invited in like, 10, 12, 13 people. Um, one of her students had opened a bakery here in town and he baked a cake for her and brought it over. Uh, and we all were in the kitchen quietly, and then each of us, each of my friends, each of her friends, had a moment with her. And they knew what I didn't know. They knew, I think, that something was happening. And I, I didn't know that. I, I, I didn't know that. But that was on Sunday for our anniversary, and then Christmas came. Our Chinese couple that we had not adopted, but we've been a host family for them for eight years here in New Haven. They flew in from California. They gave us a picture book of all our times together when they were studying in New Haven. And we would have them for holidays and breakfast sometimes. And we were just their family for eight years. And they gave her a book. And it was one of these Apple photograph books things. And we were looking through it. And I, Mary was at the table with us. She was out of bed and in the wheelchair and at the table. And we were looking through this book and it was just, if there could be magic in, in heartbreak, there was magic in heartbreak at this point that we were looking at these pictures of her back in her vigor. Uh, Friday, uh, Friday, they came down again. Jen and we came and a couple of close friends came and there was Brother King, and that was on Friday. And then they left as they were leaving around get, getting dark out. As they were leaving, I came back inside, and Mary was very tired from all of this. And uh, she kind of said, I think I'd like to go to sleep early tonight. And uh, that was that. That was, that was, in, in, it was, when I woke up the next morning, she was still asleep, and I couldn't rouse her. And I waited, and I waited, and I waited. I waited for her to just wake up, 
please, Mary, please. Finally, early, late, late morning, early afternoon, I knew I had to do something. So I called the number that had been given. And someone from uh, hospice home care stopped over. She said, I just got to go to the hospice. And I, I said, okay, I guess this is what we're going to do. And uh, I called my neighbors, best neighbors in the world, and they came over right at the time. and sat with me while the EMS people put her on the gurney to her. And she was in hospice for just about two weeks. And uh, she never regained consciousness. Uh, people came in. Hospice is a wonderful organization. I don't know. I don't know how they do it. I don't know how they, they deal with this. They're uh, angels in disguise. Uh, they and on January 11th, uh, 2015, she died. 12:30 uh, in the morning. And uh, she had willed her body to Quinnipiac University Medical School here in New Haven. So she was taken, and it was almost two years before I, I got her remains and we had a ceremony for interring her, her ashes. And I can only say what I can say, Linda, is I think you'll understand when I say that when I had to choose something to put on her tombstone, what it says is her name, her dates, and underneath it it says peace personified. And I go back, I go back, and I go back. It's only a few miles. And I see her, and I, I talk to her. She's in my life, but I also know that I remember vividly, vividly one day toward the end when she was in hospice. I'd, I'd been there all day, and I went out for supper with a student, a former student who's become a close friend. And I, I turned to him as we were crossing the lobby and I, I just turned to him, I said, Roger, Roger, my heart is broken. And I, I, I just didn't know that such a depth, such a, such a depth of pain, of loss, of anguish. Of, one of my friends asked me, weren't you angry? And I said, no, there was no room for anger. There was no, there was no space for anger. I was, I was filled with this, with this grief. That's how I felt. I didn't feel anger either. There was just no room for it. It was just nothing but grief. So, Clayton, how did you get out of bed? What kept you going? Well, the one blessing, I don't know if you can call it a blessing, but when someone passes or dies, you go to a funeral director, you go to a funeral home and you say, here, take it, do what you have to do, do what you do. Well, I didn't have that. I didn't have anyone to say, here, you do everything. I had to, I had to do a lot of arrangements. First, I had to I don't know if people know this, but in many cases, uh, obituaries are written by funeral directors who take information from the bereaved and then put it in newspaper form, and then they know who to send it to and where to send it and all of that. I didn't have that. They arrange for a service. I didn't have that. They, they arrange for everything. The arrangements, as they always say in the paper, are being planned. I, I had the responsibility of making a service that was worthy of her. That was. And was that because you, Mary, donated her body? Yes, yes. Because okay. there would be, there would only be a photo. There would only be a picture at the at the service. And I had to do the program. Well, I had some help. I had a lot of help. Uh, my, her brother Jimmy and his partner uh, arranged for all the food. Her sister arranged for the flowers. Uh, Mary's goddaughter, Emily, took care of the program and all the other things that had to be done for that. But I had to arrange for the chapel, as I said, the chapel where we were married. I had to arrange for the uh, music. 
uh, it was kind of wonderful in a way. Somebody told me what you do is you call the Yale School of Music and you get two students, how appropriate to come. And we had a, there's an organ in the church, of course. And I had a soprano, she was about 22 years old. Mary and I had talked about the music she wanted. And uh, she had two songs and I had one. So we opened with a, the Judy Collins song, Who Knows Where the Time Goes. Mm-hmm. And in the middle of the service, we did the Ave Maria. And then at the very end, oh God, now I, I can't hear this song anymore. I, when I hear it on the radio, I have to turn it off. Um, we ended with Over the Rainbow. And as I said, the chapel was filled. It was so strange, Linda, that we had a snowless winter that year until that Saturday morning. It started to snow and people were coming from, one of our closest friends and students lived in Baltimore. He could not get a flight. He really wanted to be there, but he couldn't get a flight. The headmaster from King's Academy was in this country. He was. No, he was, he had already moved back. He was no longer headmaster over there. He was living in Providence and he came down and he spoke at her service about her willingness or desire to mend a broken world. The speeches, it was, and then, and then, and then things got bad. And then things got very bad. And I guess it's not, it's, it's not unusual for a person in those circumstances. It was the worst time, of course. It wasn't the best of times, it was the worst of times. And it was winter and it was cold and there was no way to go outside. And you were kind of locked into your house. Although I had made a kind of a pact with myself that I was going to get out every day. But did you? I, every day that I could when it wasn't snowing. And I did, right. and I did. And people had me, they would come and see me. No, people didn't come to see me so much as I went to see them. And I talked with people and I emailed with people. But I have to be very honest, Linda, that did I think about joining her? Yes. Did I think I really didn't want to go on here? And the answer was yes. And I'm not an especially religious person. But at that moment, if someone, if someone had guaranteed me, had told me that there was a 100% chance that I would be joining her in some kind of afterlife, I probably, I probably, I might have done something, which to this day, I'm glad I didn't, but. So at the time, you just kept putting one foot in front of the other. You just kept taking one breath after the other. And, and, and by a strange coincidence, running into people at odd places, like at the pharmacy or at, at town hall where I had to do all sorts of legal stuff, people who I found were also coping. I remember a woman, I was talking with a pharmacist and there was a stranger standing next to me. And she said, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I just can't get over. I've lost my husband and I just, and I took her aside and I talked with her and I said, I've lost my wife and we have to understand that we are in a new existence. We're in a new place. We're in a place we never, ever thought we would be. I never, ever, ever thought of a world without Mary. And yet situations presented themselves where I could be of at least some comfort mm-hmm. or at least to someone, someone, a complete, I could talk better with complete strangers than I could with close friends. Although, although I do have cl- very close friends with whom I am very open about things and I see them and they, they keep me going. But I've also discovered something else, Linda, that at that time, a phrase came to me. I was not in my right mind. 
I was not in my right mind. Um, I was susceptible to almost anything. And I did some things that, nothing extreme, nothing outrageous, but I did book a flight to, I thought I would do something I'd, I'd always wanted to do with Mary, which was to drive the Pacific Coast Highway and see our friends, our, our Chinese friends who lived in, in uh, uh, Stan- Stanford. They were teaching at Stanford. And I, I booked reservations on an airplane and I made a hotel reservation, bought tickets to a Mets San Diego game out there where I could go to all three games. And I thought, I'll get out of this. I will, I will get myself out of where I am. And I'll never, I'll never ever forget. I flew to California, flew to San Diego. I'd never been there. It was a wonderful, a wonderful city. Everybody told me it was great, and it was. I got to the hotel, the Hilton Hotel, right downtown, two blocks from the ballpark. I had tickets for all three games. I walked into that hotel room and I realized nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. I'm still. I'm still a vacancy. I'm still an emptiness that I can't quite fill. And I can't run away from it, which I think I was trying to do at that point. I did. Most of us do. I rented a white Mustang convertible. <laughs> I drove to my, my nephew's house in, in Palm Springs. I drove out to Big Sur and drove up the Pacific Coast Highway with the top down. It was a fantasy come true, but Linda, it didn't, it didn't do a whole lot for me. What did do a lot for me was seeing our Chinese couple in, in Palo Alto, and that was good. But then I had they to held that sacred space for you. They held that sacred space for you. Yes, they do. They did and they do. They've named their baby. They had a baby last year. They named her Mary. Oh my gosh. I know. Oh my uh, gosh. Alice, Mary, Janet, Jen. That's beautiful. I had so Clayton, fast forward yep. to now. Well, you well, now. Yeah. In this. You now run. A- yes. Let me, uh, I was uh, that spring. One of the things that Mary and I did a lot in our marriage was we bicycled. I don't know how we fell into this. I don't know why we fell into it. She liked the exercise. I liked the riding. In 1978, I think it was, we took our bikes to Europe. Mary wow. was an adventurous soul. She was an adventurous soul. She she did things nobody else would ever think of, but she did. She was, she was pardon the expression, she was a pisser. And... Uh, <laughs> It's one of the things I truly, truly loved about her. And we took our bikes to Europe. We got on the plane, had all our luggage in two bags in the back of the bikes. We landed in Luxembourg. We got on our bikes. We rode through Luxembourg, Germany, Holland, Belgium, France, England, and back to Luxembourg in 42 days 1,500 miles, not a single reservation, not a single person that we could contact it with, we could meet up with. And we rode from town to town to town, finding a room each night in a, above a restaurant or above a bar or wherever, stumbling into places that we'd never heard of. We had never heard of the town of Bruges in Belgium. And suddenly here we were in this medieval canal city. It was breathtaking. It was the most perfect vacation you can imagine. Many years later, we did a hundred miles in one day together. We did a century, My goodness. which I still and can't believe so we did. After Mary passed, yeah. how long was it before you got got back on a bike? Only about four months. It was it was okay. the good weather started to come along that summer, that June, and. Uh, when I retired from teaching, I had bought myself a really good bike. I mean, a really good bike. And it was a racing bike, thin wheel and all. And I got out on my bike and I tried to ride it and I couldn't. I don't know what it was, but my balance was lousy. My, my riding was uncomfortable. I didn't feel comfortable on the bike. I don't know what it was. 
but I gave up. I completely gave up. I said, I'm not going to do this anymore. Then one morning, it's one of those mornings when you wake up and you say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm not the problem. The bike is the problem. So I went out to a bike dealer out in Brantford and I found an older guy out there. I said, Wes, he introduced himself. I said, Wes, I'm looking for an age appropriate bike. <laughs> and he said, Clayton, I got just the bike for you. And he took me over. Oh to my gosh. Place. He said, that's the bike for you. That's the one you want. I said, how do you know? She he says, I tell you what, you take it out in the parking lot, you ride that bike and then you tell me if I'm wrong. I've never felt so good on a bike. It felt, it felt great. It felt perfect. And, and, and so tell us about Ride Closer to Free. Well, that is, that is what life. you do now with Mary, Carolyn, and your brother yep. as your ghost riders. So I, I, put my, you, you, I, I put the bike back in my car. I had an SUV. I bought an SUV with the thought that I'd travel around with my bike. But I just, so I'm driving back along I-95 from Brantford to New Haven. This was in July. I'm, this is true. This, I can't make up things like this. I'm driving along 95, coming into New Haven, and up on the left, I can, I can, I can still remember it. I look up, and they have one of these large, illuminated signs, billboards, ride closer to free. There it was, not just a sign, a sign. And I said, we are going to cure cancer in our lifetime. And these riders are going to do it. Linda, I didn't think twice. I drove straight home. I went online. I found Ride Closer to Free. That afternoon, I registered for the ride. I, I paid my money. I began raising money. I sent out emails to everyone. And Linda, Mary and I had already talked about the fact that everyone in this world now is somehow touched by cancer. Mm -hmm. Ride Closer to Free had a kind of a rule that it, you had to raise at least $500 as part to be eligible for the ride, to be able to do the ride. Okay. Now, I saw myself raising about, I don't know, $60, $75, maybe $100. But I could see myself on the day of the ride writing out a check for the rest of the $500. I actually believe that. Well, that year, I sent out an email and isn't the internet wonderful? They sent out emails, and I got I got donations from thirty. I got donations of thirty seven hundred dollars. Wow! Felt pretty damn good. And I was, oh and so I did. I did the ride. It was Linda. The closer to free ride is what they call the best organized ride in Connecticut, and it is okay. They have. The 25, the 65, and the 100. Since then, they've added a 40-mile ride and a 10-mile ride. And it's not a race, it's a ride. And you right. join right. with all these other people, and you ride, and you talk, and you converse, and you hug, and you do everything because you're all there for the same reason. You've all been touched, and you all want to do something about it, and you get through with that ride and you ride it. Linda, they set it up in such a way that you leave the point of departure and you ride about two or three miles into New Haven. And you ride by the entrance to what we, what is the Smilo, Yale New Haven Health Smilo Cancer Hospital. And they bring cancer patients down to the sidewalk at the entrance to the hospital. And there they are in their wheelchairs and with their drips. And there they are cheering us on, holding up signs. And you stop and you do high fives and you do fist bumps and you do hugs and you say, we're doing this. And they say, thank you. And because every single penny the Closer to Free makes from this goes to research. Wow. Everything, it's all sponsored, so there's nothing going anywhere but to research. 
and cancer support for the patients. And it is, when you ride by there and they have a, a, a bridge of balloons that you ride under an arch of balloons and you ride under the arch and here are all these patients, some of them old, some of them young, and here come these riders, all in the same shirts. We all wear the same jersey on that day. And you ride by and you stop. Everybody stops. And you do a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this. And then you go off and you do a ride. Some people do 100 miles. Some people do 65 miles. That year I went 25. The next year, I've done it four times now. The second year I tried to go to 65. Couldn't make it. I had a kidney infection and I was in pretty bad shape from it. And I hit a pothole that really jarred my side and I, I had to stop after about 50 miles. But 50 miles, 50 miles. Then um, in the summer of 2016, yeah, the 2006, 2017, 2017, uh, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. And I had had a biopsy, and I was told that I was I had a pretty serious cancer in my prostate, and I would have to have surgery. So I said, does, does this mean I can't do the ride? They said, oh, no, you can do the ride, but you can't do a long ride. So I went back to 25 miles. So I did my 25-mile ride. And then after that, in November, they scheduled me for prostate cancer surgery. I was going to have my prostate removed. Uh, again, a medical term, and I'll try to explain it as well as I can. With prostate cancer, there is something called the Gleason scale, and the scale mm -hmm. tells them how severe your cancer is, how dangerous it is. And they told me that it was going to be surgery. So I, had, I, I was going to have the surgery in November. So I lay on the table. They put me under. A few hours later, I woke up said, well, I feel great. What happened? I feel fine. Everything's successful. We couldn't take it out. I said, what? Why? Why? Well, when we started to operate, your heart stopped. And I said, oh, come on. No, you're not. He said, well, unfortunately, it did. Your heart stopped. And we had to, and we, we let it resuscitate itself. And then we tried again, and it stopped again. So we didn't do the surgery. Now you have to have a pacemaker put in. So here's my little pacemaker. I never go anywhere without it. And it keeps me going. And because I had the pacemaker, I could have the surgery in uh, January. So I had the surgery in January. And in the summer, again, I did the cancer ride the following summer, the following September. And uh, it went it went very well. So I've done, it, I've done four rides. And uh, it's just the most... Linda, if there's anything that keeps me going, it's the understanding that there is an army of people, there's a community of people out there who are trying the best way they can to cope with this kind of loss. And I think the other thing I, I, I've learned, if there's something else, it was that even when I was thinking that this would be a time to end it all, to check out, um, I kept thinking something's going to come along, something something is going to come along that I don't know about now. Something, something, somebody, somewhere, something is going to, is going to need me for something that I don't know what it is. I don't have a clue. This was way back shortly after Mary died. And I realized that to a great extent, this is what it is. This, I mean, there's other things going on too, but this, this involvement in this, um, in, uh, well, yeah, I, I just want you to know, that I'm so grateful for what you're doing because as you said, cancer touches the lives of many. Three of my four siblings <sighs> have been touched by cancer. And for everything that you do, Clayton, every dollar that you raise, every mile that you ride, it's not just for Mary and Carolyn and your brother. It's for everyone. And I am grateful more than you'll ever know. 
And your story is one of hope because without grief, there would be no need for hope. And each loss that you experienced was harder than the loss before. And now you are determined to ride with them in your heart and to make a difference in the lives of others because of the losses that you have endured. And that makes you a hero. No, I'm not a hero. I'm and an I'm ordinary guy. I'm an ordinary guy who's saw an opportunity to do something. You're a hero. You're a hero in my book. So I have one final question for you. Sure. What's the difference between Clayton 1.0 and 2.0? How have you changed? My heart is different. Um, mm -hmm. Not just for my pacemaker. But Mary <laughs> Mary opened my heart with the love we had for each other. And that was one of the things, one of the last things I read of hers. She kept a journal. And I, I willed myself at one point to open up her journal toward, toward the end, one of her last entries. And uh, Down at the bottom of the page, bottom of one of her last pages, she wrote, I love Clayton. And that's Clayton 2.0. Clayton 2.0 is someone who can love and who can be loved, which I never expected. And that's, that's who I am. And she made me a better person with a better heart and with a more compassionate heart, I think, more understanding heart for people who are going through the same thing. It's, I, I've discovered that the lessons I've learned from all of this are too, too hard won. They were too costly. They, they, they took out too much not to be able to have some kind of benefit to other people who may be going through the same thing. And even an opportunity like this, Linda, to understand, to t say to people that people who are watching your show and praying for guidance and praying for help, um, I can tell them that none of them, that I, I cannot imagine anyone having experienced what I did. And yet I know that there are people who do. Mm -hmm. And I, I just I just can't imagine that they do. But as as hard as it is, um, we may have more work to do. I may have I probably do have more to do than I ever knew that I would. And uh, I wake up each day. And I say, Today may be the day. There may be another, another opportunity to help someone, and to, but I, but I have no idea what it might be. But that's the whole mystery. That's the whole. That's the mystery. Yeah. And that's the adventure. You are a blessing, and I am grateful. Well, not just for you, but for you coming on the show and sharing your story. It, it's. Um, I have curated stories from around the world, thousands of them. And yours is profound. And I am grateful and I'm humbled that you shared it with us tonight. So thank you for all that you do, for every mile that you ride, every dollar that you raise to make a difference and to save someone else's loved one in memory of your own. How can our viewers contact you if they have a question or a thought? Uh, I have an e they could email me. Okay. Should I give it out? If you would like to. It's all, it's all, <laughs> small, to. It's all small letters. 
C, the letters C J Curtis, C U R T I S S, there's two S's, at prodigy.net. Thank you. I appreciate you joining me tonight. And I have very few words left. Um, well, thank you. This has thank been a you. remarkable interview, and I'm very grateful. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's something to learn from everyone that comes on the show. And tonight, for me, it was just about listening to you and learning that if I can survive, other people can. But for me, it's watching you survive three losses. If you can survive three, I can survive one. And that's a gift that you've given me. So thank you for joining us. And viewers, I'm grateful for you joining us tonight. I need to take a deep breath and, um, you know, just uh, thank my lucky stars for the collateral blessings that have come into our world since our own losses. And Clayton, you are one of them. So thank you so much, viewers. We will see you again next week. Same time, same place. You all have a wonderful week. And thanks so much for joining us.